Although it seems commonplace in the armies of today, the tank is a surprisingly new invention. They first saw action less than a century ago during the First World War. But it was in the maelstrom of World War II that this devastating invention was to find its destiny as the biggest tank battles of history raged. Tanks came of age in the Second World War. They also developed quicker and changed more in a short six-year period than at any time before or since. The catalyst was the demands of a technological war. Like Darwin's theory of evolution gone mad, World War II accelerated the pace of design. Fast responses to a constantly changing situation were urgently needed, and new designs had to be engineered, tested, and built in an incredibly short timescale. The average car takes 10 years to design, develop, and manufacture. In World War II, new designs were being produced in as many months. The great leap in tank design was even more astonishing, given the restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles, imposed on the defeated Germans by the Allies after World War I. It was designed to prevent Germany developing a tank capability. In 1936, only three years before the outbreak of World War II, Germany was heavily reliant on the small and ineffective Panzer I. It was little bigger than a modern family saloon car. But in 1939, 1,200 were in front-line service, and they formed the bulk of Germany's tank forces. The Panzer I is really hardly worth considering as a fighting tank. It was designed originally for training. It just had a couple of machine guns in its turret. And apart from reconnaissance, you wouldn't dare send it out against other tanks. The majority of them were therefore converted to the sort of command tank role. And the purpose of a command tank is really just to provide transport for a battalion commander in the field. In other words, he can go out with his troops in their tanks, he can keep contact with them on the radio, but he's in a vehicle that will match theirs across country and gives him roughly the same sort of protection. The thing's fitted with a machine gun if he really gets into a sticky situation, but he's not meant to be fighting, he's meant to be keeping an eye on the situation and an ear and commanding his troops in action. In the space of three short years, German tank technology would progress from the lightweight and inefficient Panzer I to the mighty Panzer VI, the Tiger, the most complete fighting vehicle of the war. As an example of evolution, the transformation from the Panzer I to this made the animal kingdom look positively static. Adolf Hitler was the man who provided the impetus to develop the tanks of Germany's Wehrmacht. Hitler was a gambler, and he gambled upon bluffing his enemies into believing his tank forces were far stronger than they actually were. When Hitler precipitated the Second World War with his invasion of Poland in 1939, his tank forces were questionable at best, but the gamble succeeded by the application of a new tactical doctrine. Blitzkrieg, championed by General Heinz Guderian against Poland. The German command discovered a number of things which were very important. A, they didn't have the right kind of tanks. Uh, Mark I's and Mark II's were undergunned. And the second thing they discovered was you can let the tanks run as fast as you like. Uh, I think uh, Seven Panzer Division covered about 140 miles in a week, but it runs out of fuel. So what are you going to do about that? And also tanks uh, need maintenance. Uh, the other thing they discovered was that their artillery, the artillery support was horse-drawn. Well, obviously the rate of advance between a horse and a tank is rather different. The other thing they discovered was that their motorized division was really much, much too cumbersome. So the Germans learned a great deal from uh, Poland. And the, the final lesson they learned was this, do not use tanks in a city. At the end of the 19th century, when he proposed his theory of evolution, Charles Darwin noted that there were many branches which led to unsuccessful species, and hence to extinction. Of course, Darwin was talking about animals, but tanks, it would seem, followed exactly the same rules. 
1939, it was understood that tanks in the coming war would need to be able to deal with two kinds of different situations. The first was tank versus tank actions. Tanks are designed to survive explosions, even very close or directly upon the vehicle. Faced with the armor of a tank, explosive power alone is of little value. To destroy a tank, it is necessary to fire a shell fast enough to penetrate the hull and kill the men inside. Provided the target was close enough, the armor of most tanks of 1939 and 1940 vintage could be penetrated by relatively small caliber anti-tank weapons, such as the 50mm gun which equipped these Panzer III's. But armor-piercing weapons were only useful in combat against other tanks. In action against infantry in buildings and artillery targets, tanks needed to fire a high-explosive round to kill the unprotected men and disable the guns. The velocity, the speed of the shell, was relatively unimportant. But the bigger the shell, the bigger the explosion. So large-caliber guns were preferable. In this rare piece of footage, we can see how slowly high-explosive shells actually traveled. In slow motion, we can clearly see the shell leaving this German self-propelled gun as it flies towards its target. The explosion is no less impressive for the slow speed of the projectile. To achieve this destructive power and a tank-killing capability, a balanced tank force needed a mix of both anti-tank and high-explosive capability. In the opposing armies of 1939, two different solutions were found. The Germans developed two separate types of tanks, each specialized for a particular job. The first were the tank killers, equipped with a high-velocity anti-tank gun with a longer barrel of smaller caliber. Most of the Panzer III's of 1939 were mainly equipped with this gun, designed to deal with enemy tanks. All of the heavier Panzer IVs, and even some Panzer III's, were designed as infantry support tanks. They were equipped with a short-barreled gun of higher caliber, ideal for firing high explosives. The Panzer IV, when it first arrived in North Africa, and the Panzer III latterly, had a short 75mm gun in the turret. This gun was designed to fire high explosive, and it therefore served in what's known as the close support role. That means the tank stays close to the infantry and uses the gun to deal with the kind of opposition they've got to face. Machine gun positions, blockhouses and light artillery. It is not really to be judged as an anti-tank weapon in the same way as, say, the British two-pounder or the American 75. However, it had an anti-tank round which was immensely effective. But it's a question, really, of the use a tank is meant to be put to. And this tank was designed specifically to deal with those targets that the high-velocity anti-tank gun can't cope with. In contrast to the Germans, who had two types of tanks, one solution tried by the armies of both France, America and Russia was to house two types of gun in the same tank. This produced the massive multi-turreted tanks like the Char B and the Lee Grant tank. The dual turret idea was a failure, an evolutionary blind alley which was cruelly exposed on the battlefield. The two turrets made the tank difficult to operate. It was impossible to coordinate the guns, and the sheer size of the machines presented a huge target that was difficult to miss. With the figure of her commander perched some 15 feet above the ground, it is easy to see why this Lee Grant could not be successfully hidden on the battlefield. The main gun on the General Grant is a 75mm weapon, which not only fires solid armour-piercing shot, but can also fire high explosive rounds, and this was the answer to Rommel's tactics of mixing tanks and anti-tank guns. You've got solid shot for dealing with the enemy tanks, and you can fire high explosive rounds and lob them near to the enemy anti-tank gun, which would disable the crew or put them off their stroke for a while. 